Okay, this is video number two in my AP Bio topic 8.2, Energy Through Ecosystems. And here are the essential knowledge uh, terms that I will be focusing on in this video. So let's go ahead though and start with talking about trophic levels and producers before we can really talk about energy in this ecosystem. So one of the most basic ecology concepts, I think, when it comes to relationships within an ecosystem are food chains. Now, a food chain shows the transfer of energy and matter from one organism to the next. Now, this video is going to focus mainly on energy. Uh, I may or may not make another video on matter and how it cycles because it really is beautiful, um, but we'll focus mainly on just energy transfer. So in this food chain, each arrow is showing the direction energy flows in a food chain or a food web. And so here, the energy stored in the bonds in the cells of the plants is going to be passed to the mouse when the mouse eats that plant, right? And then the energy stored in the body tissues of that mouse, that energy, energy will be passed to the badger when the badger eats the mouse, and etc. as the mountain lion eats the badger. So this is the showing the flow of energy in this food chain. Now, more realistically though, in an ecosystem, you're gonna have multiple food chains. So multiple food chains are all gonna be intertwined together, and this represents a food web. So a food web is a more realistic depiction, I guess, of what actually happens in nature, um, and showing uh, multiple food chains and how energy flows uh, through this ecosystem. So when we talk about uh, food webs and different organisms within an ecosystem, we can break them up and we can define them in different ways. So the bottom of the food chain or food web is the producer level. Now, when we talk about um, how much like energy is in an ecosystem, it's really gonna be based on the producers. The producers are our autotrophs. Now, autotrophs are organisms that are going to capture energy from physical sources in their environment. So they, you may have learned in life, oh, they make their own food, right? That's the most basic way to explain it. But we have two kinds of autotrophs. You have photosynthetic organisms that are gonna do photosynthesis and capture the energy in sunlight and convert that into chemical energy and be um, building like glucose and carbohydrates and lipids and proteins and so that solar energy through the process of the light reaction and the Calvin cycle is going to be invested in the anabolic pathway and stored in the bonds of these macromolecules. So that potential energy is there waiting. So when an organism eats that plant, now they have that potential energy. Now we also have though chemosynth or chemosynthetic organisms that maybe live in environments where sunlight is not available. So this would be in the bottom of the dark depths of the ocean where you have hydrothermal vents. And there, instead of photosynthesis using light, they will be using um, chemicals. And so uh, they will capture energy from small inorganic molecules present in their environment as the basis of the food chain or the food web. Now, generally when I'm talking about producers, I'm gonna be referencing our photosynthetic organisms which include cyanobacteria, algae, kelp, plants, um, that kind of organism. And so uh, now we have the bottom of our food chain or our food web is based in the producers because they are the ones responsible for taking solar energy and then converting it into a usable or available form of energy that can support life. And so above the producer level in a food web or food chain, we have what's called consumers. So our consumers are our heterotrophs. Heterotrophs have to eat to get their energy. So when this says capture energy present in carbon compounds, that's gonna be our carbs, lipids, proteins that we eat. And then through the process of glycolysis and aerobic respiration, we can break those MAC molecules down and harness that energy. So those will be heterotrophs and they do not do photosynthesis. They have to eat to get their energy. Now, when we go on then to talk about the third factor in an ecosystem is we have decomposers, I mean in a food web, uh, we have decomposers. Decomposers are our mushrooms, our fungus, and bacteria. Now, they don't do photosynthesis, and they don't eat. 
but they fall under the heterotroph category because they're not autotrophs. They don't make their own food. Actually, when they recycle, like their job is to recycle dead and decaying matter um, back into nutrients, like in the soil. And so uh, they get their energy through that breaking down of, of matter. And so they don't do photosynthesis, but they don't directly eat, but they do uh, need to uh, get their energy from another source. And so they are heterotrophs. That was a pretty smooth one, sorry. All right, all right. So no, now though, let's go ahead and define our different trophic levels in a food web. So we can divide our trophic, um, sorry, our food web into different levels called trophic levels. And they each have a name, right? So a trophic level is basically each step in a food chain or food web. So at the bottom, we have our primary producers. Oftentimes when we talk about how much like photosynthesis is done in an ecosystem, we can re reference it as the primary productivity, as like a measure of how much like available energy there is. So you have your primary producers are first, which are our autotrophs. And then you have primary consumers, which is now the beginning of our heterotrophs. And primary consumers are generally going to be your herbivores. They're the first ones to eat. Primary means first. So they are consumers. They are eating the plants. And then you have your secondary consumers and then your tertiary consumers. So uh, your tertiary consumers are going to be like your top predators, basically. Now, um, here we can see uh, some new words. So you have herbivores, which are going to be your plant eaters. But when we get up into the secondary consumers, these are going to be heterotrophs, but omnivores, which means they're going to eat both plants and animals. So secondary consumers could eat both like the grasshoppers and the plants or the mouse and the plants, um, or they can be just carnivores. And so maybe like the snake eating just the mouse or something. And then we have our tertiary consumers, which are uh, going to be heterotrophs, omnivores, and carnivores. Now, sometimes ecosystems may have enough available energy to support a fifth trophic level, and that fifth trophic level would be called a quaternary consumer. Now, not all ecosystems can sustain five levels of five trophic levels, and that simply is because there's not enough available energy to support that many um, levels, and we'll talk about that in a few slides. So I do want to show, though, that in food chains and food webs, especially, they're all connected to each other. And so if you were to remove like a top predator, for example, let's say the predators were hunted, uh, which we see a lot happening in our current state of the earth. Um, if the predators are removed, if we look at how that impacts the rest, what we see is now the badger and the deer populations are going to increase. Their predators were just removed. Now, if the herbivore population increases, well, now you have their food decreasing, and that's going to affect other aspects of a food chain or a food web. Eventually, if they like over, this would be a discussion in our population ecology, but if they like overeat and eat and eat and the population grows, eventually they'll like eat all the grass and then the population will crash. Um, and if there's no plants and other organisms are going to suffer, etc. So all these different trophic levels are all interconnected. And I really hope to emphasize that as we move through population ecology as well as community ecology, we'll see how they all influence each other. It's beautiful. Um, and so let's go ahead, though, and talk a little bit more about these different ecosystems and the amount of energy uh, within them. And so I feel like we need to have a discussion about two terms called abiotic and biotic because both of these are gonna influence ecosystems and how much life can be supported there. So abiotic factors are gonna be your non-living components, such as water, temperature, rainfall, nutrient availability, wind, humidity, etc. And then you have your biotic components, which are your living uh, components in an ecosystem. So that are plant, those are plants, animals, but it also includes competition, predators, symbiosis, keystone species, foundation species, decomposers. So anything living is going to fall under the biotic category. And how these two like terms and things, factors come together are really critical in determining an ecosystem. So we just talked about trophic levels and photosynthesis and how important it is 
as being the foundation to the amount of energy available in an ecosystem. So we'll, we need to discuss though, what influences photosynthesis and sunlight or available light is a huge component of how much photosynthesis can be done. So if we look at the earth, the sunlight does not strike the earth equally um, across different latitudes. So up in like the Arctic circle, there's huge amounts of the year where it's dark. So if it's dark for large amounts of the year, you can predict that photosynthesis isn't really going to be happening very often versus the equator that gets a high amount of sunlight year round, you can expect lots of primary productivity um, where there's lots of sun. But sun isn't the only factor. We also have uh, temperature can influence life and ecosystems, but also rainfall, right? Like photosynthesis plants need light and they need water. So on land, uh, those two things are going to determine the amount of producers in an ecosystem. So here we see uh, an interesting diagram that kind of shows wind patterns on Earth. And the way the Earth rotates and the way the wind cycles actually determines where and how much rain falls. So we actually have predictable areas across certain latitudes that are very dry. That's where we're going to find our deserts. Then we have predictable latitudes that are going to be very wet, lots of rain falls, and that's where we're going to find our rainforests. So rain combined with amount of sunlight and temperature, all abiotic factors are going to influence the amount of primary productivity in a region and therefore the amount of available energy in an area. So I personally love this. Oh, look at my wind. Okay. I personally love this graph because it shows how temperature and rainfall can influence the ecosystems that are able to be sustained. So I just mentioned how you have predictable dry latitudes. So the brown regions here across the globe are going to be our deserts. The dark green regions are going to be our rainforests. Because when we combine temperature and rainfall, oops, where did I put my face? Temperature and rainfall, we can see how different biomes are established. So where it's really wet and hot and lots of sun, we're going to have our rainforest with lots of photosynthesis and lots of primary productivity and therefore lots of um, trophic levels and organisms and biodiversity that can be supported there. Versus look at our, our temperate deserts or our tropical deserts. Very dry, not a lot of rainfall and therefore not a lot of plant growth. Therefore, not a lot of photosynthesis, not a lot of stored potential energy, and therefore not a lot of trophic levels and not a lot of life supported. So the amount of sunlight, the amount of nutrients, the amount of temperature is all going to influence the plant life. And then the amount of plant life is going to influence the amount of trophic levels. <laughs> because when we look at energy, energy is not conserved. Energy is going to be used up in life. A lot of the energy that we take in in our food is going to be released as heat. So in my first video in 8.2, we talked a lot about metabolism and how the food we take in generates heat. And that heat is not usable energy. It is not available energy. I cannot, if I go for a run, I cannot capture the heat coming off my face and then use it to power my run. Right? So we need a constant input of food because a lot of the energy stored in our food is going to be released as heat. Now, if I eat a lot of food, any excess calories I don't use are going to be stored in my tissues. Then if I get eaten by a bear or a mountain lion, that stored energy in me is going to be passed on. But it's not all the energy I've ever taken in in my life. It's only the energy that I'm storing. I'm using a lot of my energy for life's activities. Now, when we talk about this, only about 10% of energy in a particular trophic level is passed on or available to the next trophic level. And a lot of that reason is because the energy